So I did it by Excalibur. You didn't? I did it, and then I got home, and I was telling Stephanie that they had Excalibur, and she's like, you should have bought Excalibur. So I'm been moving Nick money right now so he can get me Excalibur, <laughs> <laughs> and Sean's going to bring it home for Wait, me. Wait, are, are you just going to show up dual wielding <laughs> swords? Dude, if I, you can dual wield those swords. Are they, because they, they're stout? Here, let me show you the picture. Yeah. Jesus. It's fucking broadsword. That's, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> Matt, you're just jealous. You know you want one. Where are you going to display? Stephanie said I could hang them on the wall in the living room. So, oh wait, you're getting get, like oh, Stephanie lets you like display nerd, nerd yeah. I almost said nerd shit. Not that I don't love it, like nerd stuff outside of like the confines of your office, though, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm jelly. <laughs> I don't get to do that. <laughs> I get told no. So, speaking of the con, how was the con? Um. It, it was okay. I was telling Matt there was only a couple of comic book vendors set up mm-hmm. um, to give you an idea what kind of con it was. Rags Morales was there, and no one was at his booth all day long. Wait, what? Yeah. Hold up. Rags Morales? First of all, how did I not know Rags Morales was going to be there? Yeah, he's a, him and Michael Golden are the only two creators there. Oh, seriously? Yeah. Do I have and, time to go today? <laughs> <laughs> and no one was at his booth. So that tells you. Yeah. Uh, it was a lot of cosplayers walking around. Yep. Um, showing off their cosplay. Mm-hmm. Not that that's a bad thing. It's just not conducive to people doing business. Yeah. So. That's disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's kind of, you know, every, every time I walked by, it's like, Really? There's no one at Rags Morales' booth? Yeah, that's weird and shocking. Of course, he and... didn't have any art. I mean, he had prints out, but he didn't have any of his like his books out or anything. He didn't anything. bring any away with him? And he, and he left his table back a little bit. Yeah. So I don't know if he was working on other things. And you know, Sometimes when that happens, I'm not certainly not blaming it on him at all, but yeah. sometimes when that happens, people don't feel like yeah. it's approachable. Well, not only, well, not only that, well, I was going to say, but the other side of that is, you know, Maybe maybe they know smaller cons like this, and he just kind of fully expected it to be what it sounds like it was. Yeah. Which again, it's not a knock on like cosplayers or anything. This is not like uh, that's not my cup of tea. That's not your cup of tea. Like people really enjoy it, and it brings a lot of people out to cons, and it makes you know that that makes the con runners a lot of money. So I like one hundred percent why they see why they want to uh, um, encourage that and mm-hmm. everything. But for somebody like me and you who just want to you know go and like look through pages of art or go like back issue bin diving or check out trades or omnibuses it's just dwindling so they, rags did put on a uh, um a drawing exhibition thing nice um artist that i know that was there was going to go into it and uh he got over there and he said the line was too long to even get in well that's that's so, nice yeah, yeah. That's so at nice. least people were there going to the the what do you call breakout events that mm-hmm. they have or mm-hmm. whatever so well you know where the line is not too long to get in the line <laughs> Caleb, is not I too long never to get grow in. old <laughs> it will never get old hearing your segues <laughs> the line is never too long to get into episode 196 of this little thing we like to call the southern fried geekery podcast as per usual i am caleb alexander mcginsey matt trogdon and I'm Craig Lance. And we would like to welcome you back to another, well, I mean, to, when we're recording this, it's another beautiful Sunday morning as we're sitting around, uh, we've had our coffee, well, Craig's had his diet Mountain Dew, so he's all, he's all jacked up on Mountain Dew. Um, but no, it's a great, great it's day outside. I'm exhausted. Well, I, that too. Well, I mean, let's not lie. I would be drinking it. I've had my coffee, nice, hot, and black, just like I like it. Matt, how's your beverage of choice? It's uh, doing its job. Nice. Fantastic. Um, and so we hope you all have had fantastic weeks. Uh, it's been a long one for us, but as usual, this is kind of the highlight of my week, getting around and talk. Uh, the funny books, the comics with my, my buddies and hearing about your adventures, like like going to small cons, like you just heard Craig talk about. Um, like well, just... a lot of the artists that were there were selling prints yeah. versus, in, I never trust the prints. Like I literally saw somebody selling prints of like Amazing Spider-Man 16 cover. Yeah. I'm like, that's not your intellectual property to sell. No. 
You well, know, to be fair, none of it's their inter- <laughs> Well, I, it's I know, but property. here's the deal. If you draw yeah. it and then make prints of yeah. it, that I generally don't have a problem with. Right. If you straight straight up crib somebody else's art or, and are selling prints of it. Yeah, or, or you're just going to Google and grabbing an image and then yeah. printing it off and selling it. Yeah, I, yeah that's, I mean, that's even if you redrew that cover. Uh-huh. It still isn't yours, right? And you know that's the way I look at that. Yeah. So no, it's, it's same. Um, so I, I don't buy prints from people at cons, generally speaking, unless I know they're the artists that created it. Right. And I have to know that, but I don't really buy prints anymore. Anyway, I was gonna so. say I very rarely buy prints. Like I, and and I'm I'm fluctuating back and forth on the concept of like the mono prints for you know because a lot of artists work digitally now and that's the only way you can get their art or the pages and that you know they sign a contract they guarantee it's not ever going to get printed off again i've bought a couple that way yeah. unfortunately i bought them from somebody i wouldn't buy art from ever again right um but i have done it in the past would i do it again maybe depending on what pages it was yeah i i still have a hard time like, even though I know there's a guarantee and I know the industry is changing and it's kind of shifting and going that way, I still have a hard time spending the same amount of money I, I would spend for a drawn page or a painted page on something that was printed. Not that there is any less work or craftsmanship that goes into working on a page on like a Syntec or something like that. I agree. It's just, I, just, I have a hard time doing it just because it's not, in, in my mind, I haven't separated the, the, the phrase print from from art and i need i'm gonna have to get with the program because more and more artists that i like dearly dearly love are um are working digitally only like prime example patrick zercher who is he's doing the um the savage avengers book right now those there, there are some amazing pages out of that book that i would love to own he works digitally now you can't you can't get them um you so you have to either find out when he's selling a print or if he's selling a print or you're just sol so yeah, it's one of those things I've gotta, I've gotta get past too. So I'm right there with you. But yeah. I had no like now I kind of want to. I wish I had time to sneak he, away. He's today. he's the per. I mean Michael Golden's also there, but I've seen Michael Golden yeah. a lot. I've purchased from Michael Golden whatever I'm yeah intend to. So, um, well the flip side for guys like us, that's kind of a benefit of small cons, is yes. that you might go there and you know. Howard Chaikin might be just chilling and you just get to walk up and like have a two hour long conversation with Howard Chaikin and he's bored too. So he's willing to talk to you. Well, Matt, how was, so we heard about how Craig's weekend was. How was your weekend? Uh, good, uh, busy, constructive. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> any, any other adjectives? Prob- yeah. Lots, but I won't. <laughs> right. <refrain. laughs> um, my weekend is, um, non-eventful, just a lot of homework. Week week was rough. Like I'm not gonna lie, I had a, this was one of those weeks where, like, you just sit alone in a corner and you're like, why the fuck am I doing this? Yeah, that was that was how my week went, but it's better now. From what I understand, it doesn't get a whole lot easier once you get out of. Law no, school. I'm it's just the- walking into the dark tunnel, and there is no <laughs> light at the end. It's not. I mean, you know, it's just. Bill you know, tried to warn you. He did. A lot of people did, but no, it's it's fine. It's just. In the profession I'm going into, you know, you don't get to read things about how people are having their best day and living their best lives. It's like the worst case scenario yeah. all the freaking time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that can weigh on you a little bit. But, you know, that's why we have escapism and comics and funny books um, like the ones that you're going to hear today and like the ones that you can see uh, on our Facebook groups and Facebook pages and Instagram feeds and Twitter um, and all those places that you can find SFG podcast uh, tangents uh, that we put post. So come join our Facebook group. Let us know what you're up to, what movies you watch, what video games you're playing, all those fun things, what art you've bought, what art you've drawn. Um, come to our face, uh, not Facebook, to our Instagram page and uh, tag us in stuff that you're reading, pictures. Follow us. Let us know what things that we're posting, what you think about them, all that fun stuff. We're at SFG Podcast on that. You can also just fire us off an email at southernfriedgeekery at gmail.com if you want to connect with us just on the, you know, with the written word, as it were. Uh, and that's always going to be fun to hear from you fine folks. Maybe you have questions, maybe you have answers, who knows? Um, check in with us. Um, in the meantime, hopefully we all got some funny books read this week. Anybody uh, grab a stack of books and want to drop a short stack on I'm us? I'm going to let Matt go because I see that we both have the same book on our top of our that's page. Re- so. Yeah, Moon Knight nice. from Marvel. This is number three. Uh, this is by Jed McKay, Alessandro Capuccio. Color artist is Rochelle Rosenberg. And then the letters is... Corey Pettit. I highly recommend this. Um, It's been a long time since we've had a 
Moon Knight series, especially one that I've really liked, and I'm really liking this one. This one's really cool. Mm-hmm. So I know Craig will agree since it's on his list too. Yeah. Um, it, the only thing I keep thinking when I'm reading this is please don't fuck this up. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay. Not, not, not Instead of he, just like, it's good, I am enjoying this. Only <laughs> because I've been burned so many times on Moon Knight. I'm sorry, am I too loud? Uh, somebody's peeking. Um, only because I... I get burned so many times doing Moon Knight. So, you know, it's really, it starts off well and I enjoy it and then it kind of tanks on me. So I'm ho- you know, it's just that you've burned me enough. Quit mm. burning me. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> let's see what he shits on here. I like uh, X-Men number three as well by uh, Jerry Duggan and Pepe Larraz. Uh, color artist is Marte Garcia. Uh, Pepe Larraz's art on this is a freaking amazing yeah oh, pepe's beast God, like man. i love Pepe, and he's yeah he's another one that's you know finding art from it's rough so since matt and i share the same brain uh-huh. that's also on my list so yeah. um nothing bad to say about this book at all <laughs> we so looking at the third <laughs> book on his we? list we i was like oh. so looking at the third book coming up on his short stack was almost mine as well <laughs> but I, last minute i chose to talk about this it was actually a, from dc mm-hmm Batman the World, this is their free special edition. So this is a collection of just a few stories from artists, from creators, I should say, from around the world. Um, South Korea is one of them, for example. Of course, the American team is Brian Azzarello and Lee Berhimo. Can't go wrong. The, the re- this short story by those two mm-hmm. is freaking amazing like i said you can't go wrong i opened it i thought i thought well you know it's free and i thought well let me pick it up i opened it up to this page oh my yep. gosh this 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 lee Berhimo art between batman and bane fighting yep. is out freaking standing yep. i everything want, we should have got at the end of uh i want this batman. story i want a whole series of this this is incredible i like yeah. the man bat page next yeah to i mean all this yeah i mean he's got Catwoman in here, Poison mm-hmm. Ivy, the Joker, of course, looks amazing. Harley Quinn, but this that Bane page is freaking outstanding. Yeah, yeah. So, every yeah. page you just flipped to was. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll never get tired. This is going to sound like a weird statement, but I mean, people who have seen his art will kind of know what I mean. I'll never get tired of seeing Lee Bamejo draw leather because just the way that he paints it mm-hmm. and like the inflections that he puts on it, it's it's incredible. I like the way I always really since day one of, of his art that I saw. I like the way he draws Batman's out his uh, yeah. his uh, outfit because mm-hmm. it looks so military and tactical. Yeah. It's got a really cool look to it. I mean, if the guy's going to be the if, if he's the guy that's got everything and constantly fighting, yeah, it's just it looks like it's Kevlar. It looks like it's you know it's going to you can roll over him with a tank and he's going to mm-hmm. get back up. So, all right, Craig, deviate, deviate. Okay, I've only got one book to talk about, <laughs> and that is. <laughs> Chew number eight, and that's Chew, C H U, mm-hmm. Chew, with uh, John Lehman and Dan Boltwood. And I wanted to bring this to attention. It actually gives credit for the fonts in this mm. to Comic Craft. Nice. I've never seen that before in a comic book. Hmm. Um, this is kind of the anti Chew book, it's like the reverse of the original mm. Chew. Where you had Tony Chew being the hero, mm-hmm. now you have his sister who's absolutely the the bad guy in this book but she gets a bottle of wine that was created by a other you know they all have food powers the guy that created it actually you can time travel back to when he created it and uh now she's ends with the mob beating up her boyfriend and killing half of her team and now she's got to go and steal this uh art for the mob that she, she now knows where the artist is and it's his piece of La Resistance, right. uh, to speak. And so she's got to travel back to uh, France and to this particular vineyard and steal this guy's art for the mob. I'm, and it's bloody and it's funny and it's everything you expect out of a chew book. Um, there's memes in the backgrounds of the pages. <laughs> and I mean, it. you know, you, you got to give... Uh, got to give them credit because uh, I was really worried with the change in artists that you were going to lose some of that background mm-hmm. stuff, but it has not been the case in this mm-hmm. situation. Dan Boltwood's really doing a good job in this. Yeah. So. Can we establish a new rule? What's that? If you're going to say things with a French accent, you have to bring your beret. 
Um, so I want to establish somewhere that. Somewhere I have that, beret. that takes a lot of planning. I, I mean, but I, that's that's the kind of forethought I want. I want Craig to, to know when he's going to use a French accent um, <laughs> because I just need him to have a beret. <laughs> See, I have the exact opposite power. I don't when I drink wine, I don't go back in time. I just lose time. Like time just disappears. <laughs> that's typically how it yeah, works. That's, that's, that's what, what happens. With me. That that is yeah. Um, so I have. I have no overlap on my short stack this week. I feel left out of the group. I feel like I missed an you email need to or something. Share a um, so I read this week issue two of the Me You Love in the Dark. This is the uh, the second issue of the new series by um, Scotty Young, Jorge Corona, John Francois Bellu, and Nate Picos. Um, it's really interesting, especially seeing where these guys. The last thing that these guys worked on was Middle West together. Completely different tone. Totally different story. Um, essentially, it's this artist who. Um, very much in the the vein of, uh, not the art is in the vein of, but the, like the spirit is in the vein of like Jean Michel Basquiat, who went from a street artist and got super huge, was ne- never quote unquote supposed to be a big like world global artist, um, and this artist is, and so she goes to this quote unquote haunted house to find her like muse, um, except the house is actually haunted, <laughs> and it starts talking back to her, and um, you know it's a story about isolation and alone, and like you know the, the loving the person who is in the room with you for the next like five minutes or, or accepting that person. Um, if so you, if you can't be with the one you love, love the love one, the one you're, you're with. with. Yeah. Even if that one is a haunted house. <laughs> what, and a, what a very sixties uh, comic book. Yeah. Well, the, and, and the house, it works like it's, she starts painting all this weird, crazy uh, stuff and it's just haunty and fun and it's kind of a ghost story and it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, the second book on my list, right in the middle of my little short stack, is the second... I, I'm doing issue twos, apparently, not to crib off of what uh, EOC Comics did in their last episode. It just kind of worked out that way. Uh-huh. Um, issue uh-huh. two uh, of... Well, so they did the entire episode. Here we go. Second, second issues. Um, Maria, Maria Lovett's Porcelain. Um, and this is this is a really fun book. It's from Ablaze Comics, which, again, the only books that I've really read from them are the Conan-esque books. Um, so it's really cool to see her like doing the story i'm not entirely sure what's happening in the book if that makes sense dude it's maria love it yeah. i mean you won't know until the last issue i said that entirely through the last book she right wrote. It's, it's beautiful i don't know what's happening but it's beautiful well the gist of it is there's a there's a girl and she has become trapped in another dimension but the dimension like manifests as a dollhouse and inside this dollhouse is all of these references to alice in wonderland to beauty and the beast like there's there's roses in the little glass dome there's there's yeah. all of these cartoons and like pop culture please, please come listen to our podcast where we can tell you we don't know what's happening <laughs> in the comic books quite often well <laughs> and so the second issue what you find out is there is this being who kind of runs the place that yeah. turns people into porcelain dolls and they just she she uses it to, she's a collector of souls or something like that and there's another figure who kind of wears a fox mask um, who's just running around and is helping her avoid that um so i mean I, like i said i I the minutia the small stuff I get I'm I'm trying to figure out the big picture as far as what's happening sounds a little bit like Dollhouse which I think we said um, before from the uh, Sandman world right 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 or or the Dollhouse yeah that so it, it's got a little bit of twinge of that too so there's like this his, history there this this thing that but I'm trying to separate find out if I need to separate it so like does this fit in like the world of the Dollhouse or is she just playing off of the same thing what does that do either way well yeah. so the Dollhouse started off like you have that run in Sandman and then yeah. you got the Dollhouse that's family right. book it did spin um, out of the Dollhouse yeah, yeah and so Sandman. That's, where I, that's where I'm saying I'm kind of not sure if I'm bringing too much baggage into the book from stuff like that and, and all i know is it's beautiful yeah it's 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 maria love it so it's it's stunning and then last but not least from boom studios um a new comic a first issue called maw m-a-w i thought you said only issue number two well, so no, you're just gonna have the, to find another book those those two those go two to the happened. wall and find a book i didn't even plan it that so way lies <laughs> It wasn't a lie. I just you didn't manage your expectations. <laughs> I'm, I'm only going to disappoint. You. Um, this, like I said, this is a new book from Boom. It's Jude Ellison S. Doyle, Al Cap, uh, A. L. Kaplan uh, did the the artwork on it. So I'm going to continue with this story. But for anybody who goes home and reads this, full disclosure, it's a tough read. Um, so these sisters, they go to kind of this. Um, women's retreat camp thing one of them is super into you know, feminism and, and the other one's very much not um you know she doesn't understand why they're wasting their time and why all these women are like dancing naked in a field and it seems like just bullshit to her um but the reason that they're there is because the one sister that thinks everything is bullshit has gone through a um very hard life and a series of sexual assaults 
um, that has got her, you know, she just is in a dark, dark place uh, and trying to crawl her way back. And of course her sister says, this is, this is going to help you do that. She's not convinced. Um, and, uh, you know, in the first issue, kind of while you're figuring things out, something else bad happens to her. So it's, it's, you know, where, where it seemed like the story was going to be the way that she crawls herself up. The first issue immediately like sinks her even a little bit lower. Um, like I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue on with it. Cause I think it's a interesting story. Um, and there's gonna, it feels like there's like a supernatural bent to it coming. Um, but it's, it's kind of a tough read. Like it, it kind of like, like even I was just like, Ooh, okay. We're you you went there. <laughs> like no, no, no punches were pulled in that. So, um, interesting, interesting set of, uh, books all around this week. So, um, check, check that out. I'll, you know, if, if, but just be, be question mark. Yeah. Well, I always, always caveat with that. And I want to make sure like tell people because you know, if somebody is, has been a victim of that, they could open this up and I don't want that to like spin them out. So, but it is a good read because other people I'd go, yeah, it's a story about sexual assault. And they say, Oh, I'm never going to read that. Cause it just, why? But it's, it's a good read. It's like stories about pandemics. I have yeah. no interest in them right now. Yeah, oh, right. <laughs> so, well, we're hopefully, all traumatized by different things that won't let us. Uh, yeah, that you just can't move you, on. You from. can't. Yeah, it just it's rooted. Yep. Um, it's rooted not, and I'm not world. making light of sexual assault. Oh no, no let's be a hundred percent clear yeah. there. No, but I mean, there there are like I think what you're saying is there are books that you know that everybody hit has a things. book that has a subject. There's subjects that people just are not interested in reading yeah. about for whatever reasons, things in their past are just not interested. Right. In, so, one hundred percent, one hundred. Um, well, hopefully, there is a book that we all read this week that we all are interested in. I totally forgot. No, Damn it! I'm playing. Dumped. See, we let him go one week, and he comes back and just not not participating. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Give the man um, a sword, I, and he thinks he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> yeah. uh, did you tell people about your sword? I didn't. I bought a. Uh, Sword of Omens at the con this week. Mm-hmm. Um, fantastically priced. Nice. It is not a replica. Well, it's more like a prop replica, but it's right. not a plastic replica. Yeah. It is a full-on bastard sword. <laughs> <laughs> and I am not mad about it. And I'm actually having Sean pick me up. Sean, our ex yeah. uh, coast co-host, pick me up Excalibur today. Nice. So... Uh, I didn't know I collected swords, but apparently I do. So, catch Craig dual wielding at a con near you. Um, no, so. I am not strong enough to dual wield <laughs> bastard swords. Do you? Do you feel like Lino? Do you? Do you feel I, like I definitely you have, have sight beyond sight. Now. Okay, so just, just making sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> Craig. Craig's gonna play games at home with the swords. <laughs> just, we don't talk neighbor, about what I do with my swords at home, Caleb. His neighbor is just gonna hear him yell out "ho" and then call the cops. <laughs> <laughs> so we did as we always do this week. We got together, put our put our minds and together, and said, "Hey, we all want to read the same book and, and tell each other our thoughts on it." Um, and so the book that we read for our roundtable this week is "The Death of Doctor Strange," number one by the creative team of Jed McKay, Lee Gabbard, and Antonio Fabella, uh, with Care Andrews on the cover and VC's Corey Pettit doing the lettering. Uh, before we dive too deep into this, um, just should say w- there's no real way to talk about these things without spoiling it. So if this is on your pull list, maybe it's coming in your new- next DCBS box, maybe you haven't logged on to Comixology yet or hadn't made it to your local comic shop, um, you know, read it first or or push the pause and come come listen to us after you read it because you don't want to get anything spoiled for you. Um, and then then you really don't want to come yell at us because I know a dude with a sword and I'll send him after you. So, you know, that's that's kind of how that will work. Um, so, yeah, hit the little pause button uh, and you've been spoiler warned. Um, handy dandy Southern Fried Geekery. Spoiler warned. Yeah, spoiler warned. You will be spoiled. Um, so what did you guys think about the death of Doctor Strange number one? I love this book. Yeah. I thought it was really good. And I'm not... You know, I'm, I'm 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 actually surprised about that. Not that I mm, thought that was quality, but this is not a book that's in like when I think of you, I don't mm, think of Doctor Strange. So that makes me like genuinely happy to hear. I I've never really been. I'm, I guess I'm just totally neutral to Doctor Strange. I didn't read any Doctor Strange material at all, and until I don't know a few years ago, I went back and read Jason Aaron's mm-hmm. um, run. I read you know quite a bit of his run. And I really like that. Mm-hmm. That first arc on Jason Aaron's run is freaking great. Mm-hmm. And uh, tone at the tone of this kind of reminded me of that. But yeah, I I really dug this book. Nice, great. I, I liked it too. Um, 
at first I wasn't sure, you know, I wasn't real. Cause you hadn't read it yet. Yeah. <laughs> no, the first few pages I wasn't yeah. sure because, uh, uh, I wasn't real interested in, you know, him taking his dog on a walkie, <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny. It was cute. And it was all of those things. So it, uh, and it certainly kind of shows you the chaotic life of Dr. Strange. Just how packed it is. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, certainly by the end of this issue, I was finding myself going, I can't wait to find out what happens here. Right. So, um, it, it built on itself as it went and got, uh, deeper and deeper. And of course, you know, ended in the culmination of the title. Mm hmm. So, um, so there you go. I just gave the review. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> <laughs> is it really a spoiler if it's on the front page? Yeah. Um, so it, but there is a part of it that that is not, we probably yeah. won't spoil. Yeah. Um, that's a it's a twist, as they say. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Um, I it's I, a twist. Is that what you said? As, a, as they say, it's as a the, twist. Oh, it's a twist. I thought you said it's a twist. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> no, I don't know what an itsy twist. I don't is. either. That's why I was wondering. Um, no, I, I I love this book. So I'm like Matt. I am not well read in Doctor Strange books. I don't think any from of a, us are, yeah. From a solo level, yeah. where I am familiar with Doctor Strange has always been in team books. You know, I'm a I'm a big Defenders fan. Uh, you know, read through that omnibus that that they came out with last year. Uh, just packed that up. Have you know in the in the Avengers. Um, so I've seen them in a lot of places, like connected with team books. But other than just kind of your early Ditko stuff and uh, you know a few places popping up, I've never really followed him. So this was actually a fun little way to like center myself in some in some Doctor Strange, and yeah, no, I, I really I really enjoyed it. it. Jed McKay is a really strong writer. He, yeah. he continues to be. Yeah, in, I'm enjoying he's, everything he's yeah, on that yeah. I'm reading. Yeah. yeah, I I don't remember. He's one of those writers that I don't remember him before last year. Um, I don't know that I ever if he's done any like independent stuff or any uh, small publisher he was stuff. Doing Power Rangers, wasn't he? Am I oh, thinking of somebody no. else? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to go back. No, yeah, that was. Um, oh, I know who you're talking about. He is writing Mega Man right now. Okay. He yep. also yep. wrote yep. the Black Sphere. Radiant Black. Radiant Black. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I can't think of his name right now. Um, but <clears throat> but yeah, no. So so solid, fun book. Um, and and highly recommend. And I want to say that because you don't have to be rooted or steeped in Doctor Strange knowledge. The coolest thing about this book, besides the fact that it was well written, it was fun to read, it went through a lot of places, you saw a lot of cool characters, is that it really felt like it held strong to that every every issue should be somebody's first, and and you don't have to know eighty years of continuity or sixty years of continuity in Doctor Strange's case to to pick up a strange book. Um, so I really appreciated that. I love the cover of this book. It's it's stunning. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. And just so when I was preparing to talk about this too, I was looking up some of the um, variant covers, and there wasn't a bad cover in the bunch. Mm. Uh, it like all of it looked great, but the the cover that that Craig is referring to, it's got a um, a painted cover. Like I said, Kara Andrews did it of Strange floating, uh, being elevated by his magics, shooting out of his hand in front of a skull with like the ether and the universe in the background with all like tentacle monsters and stuff. Uh, it's, what? It's it's fun. <laughs> Doctor um, Strange and tentacle monsters. So let's dive in. Uh, so the book, <laughs> the book opens up with the with the information that Doctor Strange is not a good housekeeper. <laughs> his, yeah. his his room is dirty. He's got clothes hung over artifacts. Um, you know, he's got things like, you know, weapons in his racquetball. Uh, he's certainly rich enough to hire a racket. housekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> Stuffed in there, uh, he's got tarot cards all around the floor. His jogging shoes are are all thrown about. Um, and, and he gets woken up by his dog. And now, here's the thing about Doctor Strange's dog. And we love dogs, right? Doctor Strange's dog is technically no longer with us. He's not among the living. He is a ghost. Mm-hmm. He is a basset hound and a really adorable little fellow. Um, and, and he speaks he, perfect English. Just with a T, like enunciates <laughs> and everything. That man, that, that pup has been to classes. Uh, so he comes in and he wakes up Doctor Strange, who also apparently does sit-ups because my, bro, my man got abs. Um, <laughs> but he wakes up Doctor Strange is like, hey, we need to go for walkies. We got to get out of the house. Uh, and, of course, you know, Strange is just like, like, bruh, you're a ghost. Like, why are you waking me up to go exercise? This is dumb. And the dog's just like, well, I mean, look, really, this is not this is not for me. It's for you. And all the while, uh, in the background, there is, you know, through the narration boxes, you're getting a little bit of a, a Slavic legend. You're, you're understanding 
you're getting the story about this character named Koshi, uh, Koeshi the Immortal. And what Koeshi the Immortal did is he did some witchcraft and magic to give himself eternal life. Um, he, you know, he put a piece of his soul in a pen, hid the pen in an egg, hid the egg in a duck, hid the duck in a rabbit, because that fits somehow. Um, and then eventually stuffed the rabbit in a case and like shoved him in the closet somewhere. Um, and it gave himself he immortality. He reversed Osiris too. Right? The man made horcruxes, but like stuck them in a little like <laughs> Russian nesting doll of of eternal life. Um <laughs> And so, you know, so Stephen is just like living, living his day. He gets up, he brushes his teeth. You know, he's, he's remembering Wong's in the kitchen making breakfast. Interesting enough, making an egg. Um, no pen falls out. And so he, he gets his stuff together and he takes, he takes the pup for a walk. Um, and it's a good way to start today because Stephen has to go for a, he has to go to work uh, after this. So it kind of jump starts his blood. Now, for those of you who aren't, like who maybe like me weren't refreshed on kind of current continuity and you're like i thought stephen strange's like his work was like chilling in the house in a robe and like talking to like his armoire or something no um dr strange is actually he got his hands fixed and i think that might have been i don't know if that was in the jason aaron stuff or if that's a new no it was uh mark wade stuff was that mark wade okay yeah it was at the end of the dr strange run and then he did a run following that is uh Doctor Strange, the surgeon, or something like that. Okay. Like where he had, yeah. So yeah, his, his hands are fixed, and and he is actually getting back to his first love, the his first art, if you will, in being a surgeon. Uh, so he goes into the office, you know, pops on the gloves, goes and does surgery, and performs well, does what he's supposed to do. Um, at the same time, he he goes out for coffee after the surgery, and you know, a meteor lands on Earth, or something appearing to be a meteor, uh, lots of destruction, and he has to jump into Doctor Strange mode. Uh, and you know, go be a superhero. So so far, he's been a, a you know a dog dad. Uh, he's been a surgeon. Now he's being a uh, you know universe saver. And he shows up, and there's this man <laughs> who has who has rocketed to Earth, and he's standing in the middle of uh, Manhattan, and he's screaming, and flames are bursting out of him, and he's complaining about being able to hear things. Um, you know, minus the 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 you know, self emoliation it's a lot like somebody having just a mental breakdown in the middle of the street. Um, and, of course, the cops are there, and they've got their d- guns drawn, and Strange shows up and kind of takes takes a handle on the situation and, you know, just explains to the cops, it's like, hey, like, this man needs help, not violence. Um, you know, put your guns away and find out how to figure out how to help this man. In this case, it takes a specialist like Dr. Strange because there's magic and stuff involved. Um, in a real-world scenario, you know, you might think that a social service worker uh, would show up and kind of handle the situation, that, that there's no need to escalate the violence, right? Like, that's you, maybe we're putting the wrong people on the scene first. Um, and so he does. He comes in there, he whips out his third eye, <laughs> just as Strange wants to do, and kind of gets a understanding of what's happening and is able to sever whatever this mystical um thing is one like of my that favorite is, pages in the book because he treats the magic like he's a surgeon yeah uh it just just cuts it out like a yep. cancer um after that you're, you're thinking man strangest day has got to be done with like that's full like you've, you've you've handled your business at home you've done your job you've saved lives uh and you kept a it something infested person from destroying the Manhattan? Nope. Nope. Day's not done yet. Because Strange also is like the head of a school. He is the head of Strange Academy down in New Orleans, where all of these little gifted youngsters, not those gifted youngsters, but um, all of like the magically imbued gifted young people are learning how to um, handle their powers. Like, you know, Dormammu's son is there. This is where if there was editing at Marvel, they would put a little editor's <laughs> note Strange in there. Strange Academy. Strange, yeah. <laughs> Strange Academy. Um, yeah, that Scotty Young is just killing right now. Um, it's, it's badass. It's awesome. I love that book. Highly recommend it. But he shows up and he is, he basically gives an explanation, uh, of how he became the Sorcerer Supreme. Uh, you know, he would, the Vashanti like blessed him with this. There was a test he passed. And the reason he's here and he's talking to these people is, uh, you know, because not only does he want to help them hone their powers because they're going to be the next generation of people who help save the world and like push off any type of mystic forces or magical forces that want to challenge Earth, um, but because you know very well there could be the next Sorcerer Supreme sitting in that room. Um, and a fun little part of the, that that uh, 
Doyle Dormammu, uh, who is Dormammu's son, runs up to Doctor Strange and is like, "Hey, do you have you heard anything about my dad?" Because you know Dormammu, Strange, kind of go hand in sphere. Um, they, I can't like usually I know what's going on with him. I, I'm tethered to him. I can feel it, but something's going on. I, I can't. And Strange is just like, you know what? This is not the first thing I've heard about this. Let me let me check in and go out. Now, if you're reading other books, uh, this is also where if they were doing their the editing thing, they would say, "Go see Al Ewing's Guardian of the Galaxy." Um, because Dormammu has taken over Ego, the living planet, and is ushering in, you know, all hell on awesome. the galaxy. Um, so that's part of why he can't do that. But Strange doesn't have time to really focus on that, because his little beep-beep goes off, um, and he has to go help Magic, who is also helping run the school, um, fend off a horde of baseball-playing demons who have come in uh, from <laughs> from the netherworld. Uh, Don't that talk is... <laughs> about the Dodgers that way. <laughs> Uh, that was a deep, that was a nice cut. I appreciate that. Um, he's got to help Magic like fend these people off, and he's talking to her, uh, and is like, "Hey, like this is this is embarrassing. You need to keep you know keep these worlds separate. This is your job." And of course, she's just pissed and snarky because she's been made to look bad in front of Doctor Strange. But they manage to dispatch these creatures uh, all all in good time, and he is able to go continue to do his stuff, to, to complete the work he has to do. And at the end of the day, you know, he's able to, you know, hopefully go home and just chill with his pup, you know, put his feet in a nice little bowl of like, how do you pet a ghost pup? I would assume, um, <laughs> va- vaporally. <laughs> Caleb is making hand motions. <laughs> I don't know what this is, you... but I'm assuming there's, there's ethereal puppy snuggles happening. Um, but, I mean, the man's day is just packed full of stuff, right? And, and it's not over. It's not over. Like I said, he, he's gone home. He's put on a nice robe, um, one that doesn't levitate. Uh, he's kind of ending his day relaxing and having a nice glass of Cabernet, which I've decided it's Cabernet um, because that's what I would drink, and he's a man of quality, so that must be. Uh, but there gets a knock on the door. Um, and, you know, Stephen kind of it's like, okay, nothing good happens after 11 o'clock, so let me, let me Doctor Strange up for a second, um, and then I'll let this person come in. And he recognizes the person, but you don't see it. The person's clad in darkness uh, or in shadow. And he's just like, what are, you, what are you doing at my doorstep? Which, you know, should key you to the phrase at death's doorstep. Um, but all you see is this explosion of, of, of magic and color. And uh, I don't even know what to say. It. It's just something terrible has happened. Uh, and, you know, Strange has put up a fight. Like, he's not going down easy, but... By the end of it, you know, you know what's what's Thanos say? I am inevitable, uh, and what's happening is inevitable. And he stabs Strange in the chest with a knife, and it kills him. Doctor Strange is dead. Holy shit! Like like that's you know th- this is the moment where you feel the gravitas sink in in the story, and everyone in the Marvel universe who is connected to him to Strange feels it. You know, uh, people that he has saved who are sitting there trying to um, live their life, they. They feel something in their heart, like Thor knows it. The ghost dog who's been kind of out chilling in the park, um, you know, feels it in his soul and just starts rushing home. Things start happening all over the world. You know, Mr. Fantastic is, is chilling in the Fantastic Four's place, and he starts seeing all of these dimensional breaches and these incursions and, and you know, and what's going on. And, of course, Wong, Wong, Wong most of all, um, understands that his master has been slain. So... You know, all of these people that are connected to him, including Dr. Voodoo, they all show up at the house, and there's a mystery afoot. So, you know, we've got to figure out who mystery could afoot. have... And I, I, I'm going to assume the rest of the series now is just Clue. I think so. Like, it's getting <laughs> it's getting back to its roots. So all of these people are getting together, right, to figure out what's what's going on and who could have done this. When all of a sudden, somebody burst in the door and it's not somebody you would expect to be coming to to who would be upset about strange dying and who is that who is that person it's none other than baron mordo who shows up on the door with this alkalite and of course dr strange has just been murdered now baron mordo's here rightfully so the people kind of put things together and are like okay you did this let's kick ass let's let's and, and mordo's like nope stop Mm-mm. like i know we were enemies but only i get to kill it's kind of like the little brother syndrome. Like, only you get to pick on your little brother, but you'll beat anybody else's ass who does. Baron Mordo's mad about this. Somebody has taken his kill. He was he was the only one who was allowed to kill Strange. Um, and so they, they, they all start trying to figure out where to go from there and putting the pieces together because, of course, now that Strange is gone, 
he was the protective belt around the world when it comes to uh, to magic and the arcane, and now the world is is defenseless. So they've got to jump in and and, and help, uh, kind of under the guise of Baron Mordo. But the there's that twist I was talking about um, goes back to that story that you get at the very beginning uh, from the uh, the immortal who who left a trick. So go check out the book. It's it's incredibly fun. It's it's fast paced. It's not a long read at all. I don't think. Um, so yeah, did I miss anything? Like like let's 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 chat about it. Uh, anything that really like pulled y'all into it? I really liked. Um the way uh, Jed McKay wrote Strange's like dialect, mm-hmm. I really liked that. It, that was that was really good. He, I mean, I like the way he he wrote everybody's dialect in in the series, but specifically the way he wrote Doctor Strange felt right on to me. And the, yeah, and uh, the top standouts were him and and uh, Baron Mordo. Baron Mordo showed up. Yeah, that was really cool, man. That was really cool. Yeah, one of my favorite parts is after his death and everything's falling apart and Cap, uh, Captain America's calling, Steve's yeah. calling, um, uh, Dr. Strange, we need your help. We need your help. Shit's happening. Where are you? <laughs> uh, well, uh, we have a problem because Dr. Strange is laying there with a knife in his chest. <laughs> well, and, and in that part, Zelma Stanton is the one who answers the phone yeah. um, from, from Runaways. And she's just like, um, hi, Cap, <laughs> because they have no connection together. Is that Zelma? I think so, yeah. And there's a girl that's been living with Dr. Strange. Oh, my, so maybe that's she's Yeah, not I think she is. She had, she had, I think it's the gal that's been the... I say girl, young woman that's mm-hmm. been living there um, platonically, of yeah. course. Um, she has been helping him do research and things like that, and I think that's who that is. That, okay, that yeah. makes sense. So she she's drawn to look a lot like the chick from Runaway. Yeah. So me not knowing that history, that's just, okay, so that's actually. I cool did read through, I read the Mark Wade okay. series, and that's when that happened. Nice. Um, uh, she, she's been, you know, they kind of help each other out different ways, and... Uh, um, again, platonically, don't want right. to insinuate there's no, a no, relationship sure. there outside of um, companionship, I yeah. guess. Um, but she does a lot of his research and stuff like that. I'd almost call her his librarian at this point. Okay. She helps keep everything organized and stuff like that. So so she's splitting some some duties with Wong. Yeah, then. Wong's more of like his, um, his magical... Mm-hmm helper yeah she's more of like his keep the shit in order in the house that not makes sense like housekeeper but like his library right. keep the books Personal filed. Assistant. yeah maybe yeah. in that sort okay um that's I mean, it, yeah. We we've seen how busy his day is. If anybody needs a personal assistant, but it's yeah, him. she she's straight up like uh yeah um that's a problem. Cap, I don't know that we can send Doctor Strange. Mm. <laughs> so. For me, the strongest part of the book, um, and I think this just goes to show what we all look for, like like 10 out of 10 for Jed McKay as, as yeah. far as the writing goes. But for me, even stronger than that was uh, was Lee, Lee uh, Garbett's art. Yeah, yeah, Not, arts. You can't yeah, downplay for, it. For no, I mean, for, for many reasons, but just the sheer flexibility of... Of, of his art in this and how much he packed into this issue. There is, there's no wasted space. Um, there are, a, I didn't count them, but there are about 30 characters drawn in this book. Uh, they're like his, the, his camera angles are incredible. The, the colors that he uses that, you know, Antonia Fabella um, puts in there, play off of it incredibly well. Each page just pops and he draws it, you know, especially when we're talking about some of the, the quote unquote crime stopper moments of the book the perspectives that he gives are just incredibly cool. Like there's this one scene where strange is, he stopped a, a robbery at a gas station. And instead of showing you him stopping the robbery, he just shows you kind of like strange stepping over this dude who's knocked out on the ground. And it's like a ground level, like at his boots, but you know what's just happened. And you know, like just the, the beat down uh, that he just put on this man. Um, it's those abs. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's so. the sit ups he's been doing. Um, one but, thing I really liked, and I'm not reading Strange Academy, but uh, the character design yeah. of Dormu's uh, son uh-huh. is just badass. It's it's incredibly cool. And yep. 
I but, recommend you read that book. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, especially, so it kind of does, that book kind of does something similar. There's so many characters in that book and it follows, like you get to see so many different character designs, um, and, and people that, that you don't often see, like it almost felt like an event book. And I think this is kind of an event book, but it's not, it's like, an event book. Yeah. It is going to have tie-ins to yeah. other books. So it's, I, I mean, in a weird way, it's a crossover, right? Because it is, you know, um, if you look at the end, there was a, a list of the other books it's going to tie into. Mm-hmm. Um, Avengers, I think. Captain America's got a book. Uh, Spider-Man. Spider-Man. White so. Fox, Blade. Uh, yeah. But all of these, are, they're caveat, like Death of Doctor Strange. Yeah, um, they're going to be one-shots yeah. that tie back into it. But um, So I don't know if it's technically a crossover or not. But uh, I think it's fair to call it that. Like, it's, it's, it's because it is going to be a, a line spanning, like, it doesn't encompass everybody but it's it's line spanning so um, it's uh it's and i don't think you can talk about the colors in the book enough it's no. it's colored exceptionally mm. well um dude like well, I, I, there, there's I, I think it's karate kid but oh, it might not it not be <laughs> no. i'm pretty sure karate kid's not in this book well the whoever this person is well karate kid's a marvel character so um but Karate Kid also doesn't have mystical powers, so I don't know who that is. But there's a character um, that that you know he's got the band around his head with the rising sun, uh, but he's just fists are glowing. Um, it, th- there were just some deep pulls in this book um, that that even you know somebody who's been reading this stuff my entire life. That, well, I think it's it's intended to bring in mm-hmm. a bunch of different characters that uh, you know he's affected through different ways throughout time. So yeah, it's. I absolutely adore the page of strange and uh, magic fighting the baseball demons. Um, <laughs> Again, we're not being making fun of the Dodgers. It's just no, who they did are. you did you see the one panel on the back of their shirts? It says limbo like over there on their back, <laughs> <laughs> like as they're getting sucked into the mansion. I felt like a kid reading this book, and like that's a good feeling. Um, I don't know. I don't know what like like what y'all's. Obviously, we all loved it, but. I read this book and I forgot for a little bit I was a grown ass man. I just it was fun. It it is like a distilled joy. It reminds me of reading comic books when I was a kid, where you had that suspension of disbelief, and I I forgot that you know I can you know kind of see behind the veil and the craft mechanics of the book and and writing and and the you know the layouts of the page and everything. It just sucked me into it and let me have a fun time with it, and that to me is the best part of any comics reading. Well, it certainly is one of the, it's a book that reminds you why you're, you're reading superhero comics right. to begin with, which is, can be few and far between anymore. Yeah. So, um, totally dug it. I will be on it. I will read everyone in this series. Yeah, somehow it managed to be both heavy and lighthearted at the same time. And that's, that's why, especially, like, like I said, there's, you know, I'm not going to spoil it, but that twist on the end, um, it's going back to its roots and its roots were quirky and ridiculous and fun and and it's the thing that made superhero and marvel comics um what they are so i cannot wait for issue two i am i'm all in head first over my head i, I need more so go snag it pull lists all around yeah it's all oh, for sure nice yep. very cool um just just happy making well so tell me about a book that one of y'all read this week that i might not have read I've got a book, and to be honest, this is a book that I didn't intend to talk about, and it's much different than anything I've ever talked about before, Uh because it's a preview of a comic book. Oh, nice. Um, Kyle Strom sent this. Are either of you guys uh, Patreons of his? I'm not, no. Okay, so he sent this out to everybody that's a Patreon of Mm -hmm. his, and it's a preview of Twig, his upcoming book, An Image, with uh, Scotty Young. Uh, flipping through it, the art is going to be absolutely just freaking outstanding, as you would expect. I mean, yeah, just that page there. You know, there's a page of a giant talking mountain, is what I'm showing you. <laughs> um, with an with an underbite or overbite. Yeah, and his eyes don't line up. It's like and, he's got both. Yeah. So, um, as you would expect from this team, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to be beautiful. Uh, I'm just going to tell you some of the stuff it says about this. Uh, Twig is a very cute, blue, fantastical character uh, with a twig growing off the top of his head. Mm -hmm. So that's where he gets his name, obviously. Um, 
He's going to embark on a quest with filled with mystery and danger and uh, where nothing is as it seems. Uh, it promises to be a classic dark fantasy in the veins of Don Bluth and Jim Henson. Hmm, really? That's what it says. And uh, in the ever-changing world filled with varied lands promising no two will be the same. So, you know, it promises uh, good times. It promises pain. It promises... I mean, the character designs they have in this book... And again, it's a preview, so all I'm really getting is mm -hmm. some little blurbs on the page. And the full disclosure, I was going to talk about another book, but it didn't land with me. So... Yeah. Um, I went to something else I'd looked at and read, and, and I'm excited for this book for just the art alone and, and the creative team. I was already signed up for this book, but looking through it, just some of the stuff you see in here, I am already 100% sold on this. Um, just crazy, crazy creature designs, and it does remind me a bit of Dark Crystal with yeah. the, the crazy designs that are going on in here, so... I, I can see it. Um, again, this is a short review. It's a review of a preview, mm -hmm. so there's not a lot of story to talk mm -hmm. about. But just from what I'm seeing in this book, I'm 100% sold. There's there's one where he's sitting at a campfire where there's three planets in the sky that he can see, or three moons possibly, that he can see. Um, one where he's wielding a, a sword, which we all should own swords. <laughs> Um, I can think of some people that definitely should not own swords <laughs> for the record. licensing systems. Yeah. Uh, again, the talking mountain tree thing that we'll learn more about these cities made of mushrooms. And uh, yeah, I, we know Scotty Young can do this world right. based on, I hate Fairyland. Yeah. And well, you and, take and Oz and yeah. And you take Strom and put him on this mm -hmm. as the artist and we know what he can do. I don't know that I've ever seen him do this style before, but it's... Uh, I, I was going to say, so just from what I can see on there, this looks a little bit more... Um, like Str Str Strom's work, this looks more cartoony. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm using air quotes when I say that, than, than what I've seen before. It looks more akin to something that you would see from Scotty Young or um, yeah. it, it may, even like Jorge Corona. I mean, um, like, I don't know who this little dude is. It looks like a frog with a tool belt and a hammer. <laughs> but I'm very interested to know what his story is. He's wearing goggles. I mean, I, this is this is a well-put-together preview book yeah. in that it shows you scenes. from. It's like watching a trailer, basically, mm -hmm. um, which I've never seen with a comic book before. Yeah. You know, it, and that's essentially what this is because you're left trying to piece it together. Well, I wonder what he's doing here. And, yeah. You know, but... There's one where you have rocks with floating with runes written on them, and they're floating above the sky. I mean, I I am so into this. This is straight up a book meant for me, and uh, I've already signed up for it. But if you oh, have it, yeah. um, you need to get to your local comic book store and sign up for this. So, so coming 2022, it says. It's interesting because, like, talking about Kyle Strom's art, I mostly know him from like horror books. Yeah, um, and this is way more like I like. The spread imaging is way more whimsical, I yeah. think, than what you've seen in his stuff before. Yeah. But we know from reading other Scotty books that Scotty does a really good job, as, even as a writer, like like giving a whimsical like surface and then like throwing you through it like it's a table. And, and, and he does a good job of picking artists that kind of can mimic his yeah. cartooning style. So, um, it, while not straight up cribbing it. exactly yeah it, it's, it's a similar style to what he does that kind of whimsical f fantastical style. in the family like yeah. you know you, you trace its root back to like mad, mad magazine um that kind of thing i think um and who doesn't want to read a story about a a blue creature with a twig growing out of his head kind of, named twig he's kind of adorable does it say who does the colors on this book it that just says oh if, yes actually it does it's jean francois okay that's what i thought Ballou, and yeah. i do not have my man hat. so much french today <laughs> um, um and letterings are by yeah lettering is by nate pico mm -hmm. so blambot so yeah. Um, um, Jean Francois does all of uh, Scotty's coloring when he yeah. draws. Like he was the colorist on Fairyland, and, and which and makes sense because it's a yeah. Those dudes have been working together for over a decade, and was 
in a chat with Scotty talking, and apparently they have not actually met in uh, person. <laughs> Um, not too long ago, this was like last year. He was he was talking about it with some friends. Well, um, there's a there's a page where he's walking down a road. It almost looks like uh, Wizard of Oz. It's kind of a yellowish road, you know, and fantastical shit happening all around. I mean, it's just it, it's got everything in it that I would want in a book just from seeing a preview. If I saw this trailer, I'd be like, okay, when do I get this movie? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you said you've already signed up for it. Now, is this coming through the normal channels? I, I don't know. I, I thought I'd sign, but it's coming 2022. It's coming from Image. So okay, so it is an Image. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the reason I ask that, we know Scotty's one of the creators who's who's on Substack and yeah. doing stuff through Substack. We're not exactly sure what yet. So I was just curious if this was a Substack book. This is listed as coming through Image. It's okay. an Image book. So, um, uh, again, I would highly recommend signing up for it as soon as you can. Well, if you liked uh, Dark Crystal, mm-hmm. or it's got it's got the feel of Bone a little bit. Yeah, there's some, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. <clears throat> uh, so <clears throat> sign up for it. I know that's a weird review, but it was. Uh, yeah, I haven't gone to, yet. Huh? So you think that's weird? I haven't gone yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's awesome. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Well, you you've sold me if that makes sense. Like I was already sold anyway, <clears throat> but you you've double sold me. I'm gonna buy two copies now. Yeah. So. Double salt. All right, all right, Matt. Out weird him. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, for because we're on not on video and this is only audio, y'all can't see the majestic garb that Matt has on. Um, my I man, thought you were talking about my complete life give up that I'm wearing here: sweat <laughs> shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> you, you conned yesterday. We're like we were not like it's fine. This this is appropriate. Matt showed up today to record this in a shirt. Now uh, it is it is a black t-shirt, which is not um, abnormal for Matt to wear. That's you know you can have any color in Matt's closet as long as it's black. But it or is gray. clad across the chest that it says barbaric and it's got a picture of the main character of that comic by vault with the ax and it's badass and i am jelly i'm don't call me jam because i'm shaking like jelly yeah, that's what i do it's badass make I, people jelly absolutely i love it with my style i'm Your gonna style. is can, can i if if i order that shirt and walk around can i say i'm cosplaying matt i think you have to i mean yeah. you, you've shaved your head so you're close <laughs> it's, it's not shaved <laughs> It's closer. Now you just got to grow your beard out. <laughs> That's not wah, funny, Carl. That's hateful. That's a... Uh, you know I can't grow a beard. Why low, would you say that? Low blow there. Sorry. Right in the dick. I'm sorry. All right, Albert. It was. That was bad. I'm sorry. So, I apologize. I thought what I would do is I would... So I didn't leave any of our listeners hanging from last week. I can continue on in the theme of Rob Liefeld's character profit oh nice as i went into last week so i thought i would just do my due diligence and really do our audience service by going back and talking about the first appearance of rob liefeld's profit which occurred in uh young blood number two from image comics now technically this was back when they were still being produced by malibu comics i'm just i'm shocked that you cracked open the 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 casing that you keep it graded in just to bring it to talk about this show. That is that is the links I'll go to for That's, the for, for this the podcast programming quality. It's like juggling diamonds, bro. Yeah, it's um, like blue ha- blue haired uh, Wolverine. So 1992, okay, um, is when this came out, uh, and this is the first printing. In case you can I touch it? I, I Absolutely not. Oh man. So this, uh, I went back. I and heard I they re- were putting the pages in the Smithsonian. I remember going picking this comic book up after I read the issues that I covered last week because I was like, well, I've just got to find out the uh, history of Mr. John Taylor Prophet. So I actually went back and reread this whole issue. And, you know, I know it's a cliche at this point to beat up on Rob Liefeld, (laughs) but man, oh man, the the, uh, delivery here is quite the thing to revisit. Um the main villain in this series, this Young Blood series, name is Dark Thorn, mm-hmm. with two ends because creative. Um, and this could not be a more dark side knockoff. Could not be more of. And and again, in the vein of Rob Liefeld cliche, beat him up him. I, I just have to mention the way he drew Mister Dark Thorn, and specifically everything from the knees down. <laughs> yep. I mean, Rob, come on, bro. Come on. 
Why you do this? Man was busy. Why you do this? <laughs> I mean, it's obviously what happened is he drew the upper portion of this character and realized he ran out of room and just compacted everything below the knees. He's leaning forward. It's all about perspective. It's it's bizarre, man. Why? He, he skips leg day from the knee down. And again, I'm sorry. I know it's an old cliche to talk about Rob Liefeld and feet. Well, we can just, cross Rob Liefeld off of the people that will ever be on the show. But I, mean, uh, <laughs> I just, you know, I know you can do it, Rob. I know you can do it. You just don't. Uh, so I just want to I want to say that for, for Mr. Liefeld. But what we find out in this issue is that... Um, Mr. John Taylor, Taylor Prophet uh, has been discovered in a basically an abandoned laboratory, and he's in a cryogenic chamber. And um, not the Youngblood team, but their B team, the Berserkers, that we all remember mm-hmm. from uh, Youngblood, they have discovered him, and they're like, oh. We they're... don't all remember that from Youngblood. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Strange. I've got him on a flow chart somewhere. So the team has come to discover that uh, – Mr. Liefeld has been in this cryogenic cha- chamber since World War II, um, and a little bit of his background, he was um, tested upon by a mad scientist, and uh, John yes, Taylor Prophet took to the, the experiments like a duck to water and excelled, and then was immediately put in a cryogenic chamber for some reason, and, you know, because that's the place that you go. And um, Storage. As they're... You know, the team is analyzing the chamber. Um, one of the team members uh, named Cougar pushes the wrong button. <laughs> and but- out comes Mr. John Taylor Prophet. But buttons are hard. <laughs> yeah, push the wrong button. So here comes they had it labeled. Wrong. Here comes Prophet. It wasn't his fault. Yeah, it didn't say do not push. Right. So yeah. it's their own fault. <laughs> And um, it was funny. So, so Prophet comes out of the chamber and he's standing there scanning the scanning the team. And Pro and, and Mr. Cougar, who let him out, is like, "Don't be giving me the dead eye, boy!" And decides to attack him for give, looking at him funny yeah. after coming out of a cryogenic chamber. It was the nineties. Kind of a dick move. I mean, this is supposed to be a hero team, you know. <laughs> so it's like, well, you know, what's this guy's fucking problem? So. They attack Prophet, and, you know, of course, Prophet's fighting them off pretty well. The dialogue in this, the dialogue in this reminds me of old kung fu movies. Yeah. You know, I, too, have been trained and developed to be the finest of my species, to excel in combat, as he's fighting <laughs> Mr. Prophet. Uh, the, the dialogue is, frankly, so bad, it's good. Yeah. I, it's, I'll, I mean, it's, it's yeah. so bad, it's good. You know, there's a character named Riptide, and apparently mm-hmm. she can control water, you know, can pull moisture from the air even and control it. And so, Sounds you know, like one of the mirror. team members is a time, take him, take him, Riptide, he's all yours. So her <laughs> response, pushing my limitations to the test must give you some perverse pleasure, Sentinel. But I suppose if I can conjure up enough moisture in the desert to create waves... Doing the same in some scientist's sweaty workshop should be no problem at all. And then she does what she says. Yeah. And uh, I love back in the day when they used to tell you exactly what they were going to do. What they were going to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it didn't leave anything to the imagination. Yeah. Of, was... of course, you know, as I mentioned in last week's episode, <laughs> one of the main characters in the Young Blood storyline is a character named Kirby, Jackson right. Kirby. Mm-hmm. Um, Rob Does he Lyfe, make an appearance? He's in this because they're act, they're actually on their way to save him. Oh, okay. um, when they arrive to save him, what they Rob have found Lyfe out that he has save. been kicking ass the whole time, and he's not the one that needs saving. But yeah. hey, he's good. Glad to see. Well, his as buddies. we know, only Rob Liefeld's art can save Jack Kirby. <laughs> in, in his own mind, <laughs> a lot of Kirby crackle in yeah. this. Kirby in this, crackle. <laughs> uh, Rob Liefeld finds places to squeeze in Kirby crackle. Yeah, and, and, and you know he so. It's easy to bust on him, but he does, you know, he does love Kirby, and he he, yeah. he he did that was in his mind what he was doing. He was he was absolutely trying to channel what Kirby did into modern, fun, um, insane comics, and well, you know, I mean, he wasn't the only one at the no, time it, doing this it stuff. Whole... It was just what was going. I, I do want to point out that Matt still has the trading card right. inserted in his comic uh, book. Of he course. Never... I told you he cracked the he cracked the CGC. He has never pulled out. out his trading card. Of course, yeah. 
Can't so if you get if you ever buy Matt's copy, it is complete. You know, and going back and reading this reminded me of why I liked it yeah. as a 14 year old. Yeah. I mean it's I mean this is a this is a comic book for, for young kids. teenagers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lot of action. Hyper violent. The sexy. dialogue is sexy know, people. It's easy to read and simple. I mean, it's a, it's a, there's a reason this was very popular. Yeah, there's, there's a low, there's a low entry threshold for, so, for that. You know, it, but that being said, that there's, it's also funny to see the, the things that I remember reading as a 13 year old that confused me, and that's the dialogue inflection not matching the facial expressions of the characters whatsoever. Yeah. Really weird. It's one of those Liefeldisms that it's just, it's all over the page. But, yeah, I mean, I'll I'll say it. I mean, when I was thirteen, Liefeld was one of my favorite yep. artists. You got but, it because of blue haired Wolverine, didn't you? That is um so no, that is a uh, that would be a beast ripoff. I know you don't know much about the X Men, so Yeah, that is feel, Beast, yeah. yeah. There's a character called Beast. Uh, and yeah. um but you know, you looking close at the art too is really funny. This cross hatching that he puts that yeah. Liefeld puts on in places that there is no reason to put no, that No, it's just there. texture. It's it's filling up it's filling up the page with the most uh, in yeah, texture where it doesn't belong. Where, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean so. it's really weird. But he frankly, you know, the way he laid out pages mm-hmm. really was new at the time, so it gave his comic books a lot of energy. Right. Back in when he was doing X-Force, New Mutants, all that stuff. I mean, his layouts were just nothing but action. Oh yeah, front I to mean, back. I mean, there was, and that's why he was so popular is because they were new and exciting ways to lay out a page. He and he and Mc, I mean, it, all the people who left and formed Image, you know, Lee McFarlane. Later on, you get uh, you know people like Larry Stroman. Um, you know, they're, they're, they they like you said, there's a lot of energy. It's kinetic the way that they you know again camera angles and stuff. It was it was fresh. It was fun. And so Liefeld is a char- is a, is a character. Like like let's face it, Liefeld is a character. He's built up his own persona, um, much much in the vein of Stan Lee. You know, people who created something for the public to see. And it even back then. So I wasn't connect, collecting comics or anything or reading comics when these first came out. But I, I don't like Liefeld's art. I, I don't like I'm saying that subjectively I don't it doesn't like fill me with the warm and fuzzies I don't like it but objectively I can appreciate that it does have an important place in the history of the medium and it was very important in in the 90s not only for just the development of comics but also for the comic market uh, and you know like I, I don't think I personally like Liefeld as a person just based on what I've seen the, the personality and persona that he puts out into the world for people to see you know, but but that's that's neither here nor there. Um, so for me, it's just one of those things. Like I can, uh, you know, I, looking back on this, you know, you have to appreciate the time and the the baggage that comes with it, and understand the world that it was steeped in and what was happening in the moment. Um, and and you see how you can go from you know really incredible. Um, you know, other people who were working in the '90s were you know Barry Windsor Smith and in the '80s and stuff like that, and how this how it evolved and how you get this pocket of now we look back and the art is the art's not great. It's, it's really not, it, you, you know, but how in that moment it blew everyone's minds. Um, and it was something that was just wholly inventive and novel, uh, almost. Well, it was the art we were drawing as kids when we would try to draw yeah. a barbarian at home. It was, you know, extra muscular, extra. It, it, it was that, it is, and as Matt said, this was definitely um, for a teenage audience, yeah. and and we got to keep that in mind when we look back on this stuff. It it's not for necessarily forty year old men yeah. to go buy it now. True. I so, mean, I'm not criticizing any forty year old men. That <laughs> I mean, we're doing a comics podcast, so yeah. uh, that, no, that would buy Young Blood, yeah. in particular, or that art. I'm just saying that that particular yeah, time, as Matt said, it, it was four or fourteen. Well, there are you know again these '90s comics are just a fascinating time capsule. Yep. Yeah. To to me, it's just yeah. You know, it's like looking back on your childhood. Read it, well, and you know, putting all this in context, reading a, you know comic like this and 
you know, like I said, it's low hanging fruit and cliche to beat up on Liefeld. Meanwhile, he became a millionaire during right. this. Multi. Many so times it's over. Yeah. It's fascinating to yeah. me. So. Well, and the thing is, is there, there's, you know, even even with that, there's two types of quote unquote beating up on Liefeld. There's doing it just to be a troll, and then there's doing it just being self aware. It's like, yeah, these things are true, and also it brings me joy to look back on it. Yeah. So, and and I think as long as you're doing the latter rather than the former. Um, even though, like I said, even though I'm not somebody who just, I, like, I don't give a shit about Rob Liefeld's opinion of anything, much less himself, but, you know, I still don't see the point in just, anytime his name is mentioned, you get the same people saying the same stupid stuff in the yeah. comment section, and there's just, no, I mean, why? It's like, you're not, pro- like, you know, so, but look back on it with the eyes of a child and realize mm-hmm. the joy that it brought you at the time. Um, that's, that's, that is, that is special. So, and he created Pouch Man later to make up for did. all of it. So. Like he, he's self-aware, and that's the thing is you have to realize about Rob Liefeld is he is self-aware to an extent. Yeah. Um, yeah. So last week when we were talking about this, I'm pretty sure it was last week, we were talking about who our favorite kind of image founder was. Um, mine is Silvestri. Yours, I think I remember you saying it It was McFarlane. At the time, yeah. yeah, far and away, far and above, it was Todd McFarlane. Yeah. No doubt about it. Craig, who was your dude? I would go with McFarlane at the time. Uh, I would have, I would have bet Jim Lee. Hmm, I'd have lost that money. Yeah, no, McFarlane for what he was doing on Spider Man before he left, um, which I realized he had already left Spider Man yeah. by time. That, but um, absolutely one of my favorite Spider Man artists. Yeah. Um, so a, a lot of that is tied back to that. Okay. So it's, it's interesting because when we talked about this kind of that same thing and Matt mentioned it too, we talked about his work on Spider-Man and Hulk and stuff like that. It's interesting to me. So y- y'all's what makes him your favorite of the image founder comes from his work pre image that he brought or that he brought over to image. Mm-hmm. Mine, In fairness, I've never read spawn. Well, so yeah, really, yeah, sure. I never have. I've wow. never read one issue. Of spawn. Wow. For me, re- the reason that, um, that Sylvestri is mine is for the work that he did at image and top cow. So mm-hmm. I just like, I'm, I just, I think that's interesting and in how we, we, we just like build those decisions in ourselves. That's, mm-hmm. that's fun. Things to I, think I probably about. need to rectify that, but I just never have. Yeah. I th- yeah. I mean, you definitely should. I think it's, um, you know, read it until, until you, know, you can't, you can't. I think <laughs> the best way to handle that. <laughs> so, but it's worth, you know, it's definitely worth checking out I for so many reasons. Your... One being, I mean, this is his first creator owned work mm-hmm. yeah, to see him do. His, yeah. To see him do exactly what he wants to do. Yeah. Yeah, and the artwork and the story, I mean, it's a lot of it holds up pretty well yeah. when it started out. I I went back and re- I've read it a few times throughout the years to kind of revisit it. I I still like the original you can, story. You can take the plot and you can turn the plot into a modern day story very easily. I mean, it's I mean, not complicated. No. It's fun. The artwork's hella fun. Interestingly enough, so I've read some Spawn. I haven't read all of it, like by any means, or even the bulk of it. But some of my favorite modern artists um, come from Spawn. Um, Jason Sean Alexander, uh, Greg Capullo was a was an artist on Spawn for a long time, and it's funny because I I'll pick up any mo- let me rephrase that I'll pick up most books that those those people draw today just because I, I adore their art, um, but I haven't read kind of the area X Force stuff like that that they um, that they came out of. I've read some X Force, but not not a lot of it. X Factor was always my thing, um, but yeah. So I, sh- we should also rec- maybe we should like pick a trade or something and do that for a a round table. Do like the first a, an arc do the first something. arc. I'm fine with that. Yeah, we should we should do that sometime. Um sometime soon. Let's make that happen. So but yeah, same. That's fun stuff. So you look at you guys forcing me to expand my horizon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nothing says contextualism and nuance like spawn. Spawn <laughs> like nineties superhero comics. <laughs> and Caleb will be like, Spawn. Todd McFarlane's just really channeling Todd McFarlane in this book. (laughs) (laughs) Really, really is. Um, So I'm going to take us back in time a little bit, but I'm not going to take us as far back in time as Matt took us. Um, I'm going to take us to the year of our Lord, uh, 2016, uh, April specifically, when a trade paperback that I'm holding came out. Um, that I know Matt has read, uh, that Matt enjoyed. I think Craig may have read it. I have not. I've actually, again, now we're talking about another series that is on my list, actually, to get to. How many other shortcomings are we going to expose before the show's over, I wonder? He's got a sword. I'm not not, not, not I I have not. I I have the first trade of Criminal I have not read. Okay. Well, and and that's the book I'm going to talk about, is Criminal by the the one and only uh, 
the great Ed Brubaker and Mr. Sean Phillips. Um, with art in, or not art, with color in this book, um, not by the usual suspects that you would imagine. There is actually, um, I hate these books because they don't make the, the things easier to find. Uh, this is not the the regular colorist. This is not Betty Brettweiser or, uh, you know, now that Phillips' son is doing it, um, this is this is the different colors, which uh, Val Staples. Sorry, it took me forever to find the name. Sorry, uh, I was and I was overlooking it. It's actually in big letters for like old man eyes. It's Val Staples doing the colors. So I want to tell you guys about a man named Leo. Um, Leo is he's not a he's not a good guy, but he's not a bad guy. Um, you know, he would you say he's a criminal? He's a criminal. Uh, he he is a thief. Um, he is a pickpocket. Uh, he was kind of born into it and raised. He's he's part of a a, a criminal lineage so to speak, but but he's also a coward. And it's that is actually the name of the first arc, this first trade paperback. It's it's criminal coward. Now, he's kind of actually retired. It was where he's at in this book. Um, he had a heist gone wrong. Uh, they were supposed to rob a bank and you, you know he is you know, he, he has rules. He's a man who who follows rules uh, that he sets up. This kind of like criminal code, so to speak. And part of his personal criminal code is no guns. You shouldn't need them. If you're doing your job right, you never get close enough to have to use a weapon, and you should always have an escape route. Um, he wants to steal, not kill. Uh, but in this heist, lots of bad stuff happens, and people die. Uh, it, 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 it is, it's terrible. It's bloodbath, kind of. Um, and so he's kind of gone off the radar as far as his criminal enterprises go. Uh, until one day he gets, uh, you know, the, the proverbial knock on his door, and it's a uh, it's old acquaintance um, named uh, I think it's Sal. Uh, he 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 comes there and there's he's he's with a man who, you know, black guy in a suit, uh, kind of looks like a might be a cop, and it turns out it's because he is a cop, and they are trying to recruit our buddy Leo into uh, jumping back in. And first of all, Leo's not having it. He's just absolutely not willing to go there. He got out of it for a reason. Um, but the thing is, is Leo's kind of the best of, of what he does, and he can he can make a plan like no one else. And he can his 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 reputation, his entire thing, is being able to see every angle and plan and plot every angle to make sure the heist goes right. And they're going to pull him back into this world. and And the idea is to to steal a bunch of diamonds. It's what they're going for. There are diamonds that have been locked up in evidence from a from from who knows what kind of case, and they're going to be moved via armor truck to the courthouse. And they want him to plan the heist, to plan the, the to, to getting these things out. And he's not he's not down with it at first. Like I said, um, then he gets a visit from somebody that he has got a history with, a relationship. And this is a this is a woman who actually was married to uh, one of the individuals that was killed in the heist that went wrong inside this banking heist that left everybody um, you know dead and that p- pushed him into retirement and she she comes to him and she says look I'm raising this child on my own because my husband was killed in this thing that you should have helped with and you didn't you owe me you owe me to help me get these diamonds I'm in on this they brought me in mainly so I could get you to come in you're doing this and he, he kind of guilt trips him into it he's like yo okay you know he's he's a he's a criminal with a heart of gold he doesn't want to see anybody suffer so he, he does, but he, he lays it down very clearly. He's like, we're going to do this. We're going to do it by my rules. We're doing it under my terms. I control this. You guys don't. Um, that's that's the way this has to work, or, or I'm out. And they agree. They're reluctant, too, because, look, number one, the cop who's involved, he doesn't want anybody telling him, dude, is headstrong. He's a hothead. He you know threatens to just beat people up. He's the kind of person that turns the body cam off and just you know violates people's civil rights. <laughs> you know he's, he's a bad cop. Which is why he's planning a heist. I mean, this is not a good dude. Uh, I mean, so, yeah, that's usually the first hint yeah, that the cops gone bad. Kind is of an plans indicator a heist. that they're doing yeah. crime. Yeah. Um, so they they get this set up. I mean, they do all the all the groundwork that they need, need to do. They 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 get a couple of cars that are unassuming, and they make sure that they have them. They follow the armored truck to figure out the armored truck's route. They stage a quote-unquote vehicle breakdown on the truck's route so that they can see what route the truck would take otherwise um, to kind of go where they're not, um, you know, where, where they would go if, if they don't take the regular route. Um, they're, they're mapping this out from all angles. About in the middle of this, though, our boy Leo starts to get a bad feeling about some stuff. He, he feels like maybe they're being double-crossed. 
Um, like maybe these guys are planning on flipping the script on them after they get the diamonds and leaving them to rot, leaving them in jail. And that is Leo's biggest fear. Like that is the thing that, you know, pushed him out in the first place is he doesn't want to die in prison because that's what happened to his father. Like I said, his father was also a criminal. Um, he doesn't want that. And he knows that somebody like him deserves that. Like he has this kind of consciousness that says, you know, this is, this is what the universe owes me. This is my karma, but I don't want it. I'm going to run from it. Um, in addition to that, um, his father's old partner, um, who is now an, an aged man who is got two things working against him. He's addicted to heroin and he has Alzheimer's. Those he, are bad yeah, things. He, and they, you know, one, one may have led to the other. Um, but he's this old guy who's living with Leo, who Leo takes care of because he's kind of a father figure. He raised Leo after his dad got sent to the clink. So there, he's got this duty as a almost a son to protect this man, um, and it's it, it adds a bit of both sadness and levity because the guy's like out of his mind, and you know Leo keeps hiring these these uh, day nurses to come in, and he keeps running them off like because the man is a an alpha level pickpocket himself. And those things didn't go away. So, like, you know, the nurses keep complaining about how, like, you know, I was sitting there and next thing I know, like, he's holding my purse. And one comes in and it's like, he was holding my panties. I didn't feel him take them off. Like, this is bullshit. <laughs> and runs them all off. So, he's got that. That's also one of the things that makes him kind of jump into this heist. Um, but he wants the money. And so, this is where he he knows. He kind of feels like they're going to get shafted on this. And so, he, he and... Um, the, the woman that came to him, the woman with the child, they, they make a plan. Um, they're not going to let themselves get screwed over. They're going to make sure that, that the daughter and that the old man are well taken care of. So the heist happens. They, 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 they stage a breakdown. They send the armored truck on a different route through a tunnel where they have strategically parked a uh, getaway car that has a sign on it that says, you know, out of gas, please don't tow, because they know that it's going to take the city about three hours to get a tow truck to it, and it's in the tunnel. That's going to make it even harder because they can't get traffic through and everything. That's where they're going to do this heist. Here's the thing, though. That's their car. That's their getaway car. Perfect planning, right? Like, this is ingenious, except for one little flaw. Um, the whole thing has been a setup from the get-go. They're not, they're not, not a setup by the police, by the real police, but more of a setup by the dirty cop. Um, they're not actually meant to to heist these diamonds. They are meant to heist a briefcase full of heroin, full of smack. Um, where 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 our boy, where Leo thought, okay, I'm going to get diamonds in hand, and then they're going to flip on us. As soon as they crack open the back of the truck, that's where the double cross happens. That's where these guys flip the script on them. They they kill um, other people who are involved. They shoot the woman, uh, the mother, uh, in the stomach. Uh, so. You know, Leo grabs the case of heroin, like pushes her into the car, and they get the fuck out of Dodge. They're able to to escape and go hide out on this farm. Um, but as you might imagine, now they're persona non grata. Um, uh, you know, the police are looking for them. The criminal element that's looking for them. The people that wanted their I heroin. What that means I watched John Wick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the 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 this this drug kingpin, this drug czar. Um, is looking for them as well. And they're, they're pulling no stops. They're bringing in all the nasty people. Um, part of why is number one, they want their money. The flip side of that is again, they all view Leo as a coward. The man doesn't use guns. He's known as the guy who will run away from a fight. He's, he, he is the guy who is going to get out of a scrape. He's a guy who like, if, if he's surrounded on all sides, he finds a way. Um, he's not going to stand and fight. So they just don't kind of respect him. But what they don't know is that Leo is not, in fact, a, a coward. Leo has that ability, uh, or he has that that character trait, because, in his opinion, killing is way too easy, and it will put you on a slippery slope to more killing. And he's done it before. They don't know this, but he's a murderer. And he knows how easy it was, and it scared him. Not the murder, just the fact that he wanted to do it again. Mm. So some things happen in this book some, as a result of double crossing and as a result of the mom and the, the connection to the kid and that family history and the old man that sent him into John Wick mode just since you, since you broke that ice. And he is, not a, he is not a man to be fucked with. And none of them see what's going to come. 
You should um, never make people that are not to be fucked with persona non grata. Yeah. Um, so I'm reading the trade, and like I said, I think it's six issues, and they get to the heist about the end of the second, first, or the third issue, and I'm like, wow, they just moved really fast. I didn't see any of the back back of this coming. It, it, I, I read a lot of crime books. Um, I, I knew when we were getting to that that there was more, and I was curious about what was going to happen. Brubaker and Phillips walked us down a path that, like... It was surprising. They threw in all the twists and turns, but if you, if you once you hit it, you realize that they were uh, they were leading you there. That it makes perfect sense. You start realizing seeds that they planted in the first couple of pages. Um, there's a reason these two men are geniuses and are probably one of the most dynamic teams in comics today. They 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 understand each other so well, and their their languages, you know, Phillips' visual language and Brubaker's uh, you know, literal language weave in together so well like they, they they are they are part and parcel to me in these type of books there is there is a singular voice um in harmony with these two creators and i, I find it fascinating um whereas in dr strange like i said it made me feel like a kid again i was giddy i was reading comics like you know want to go get a bowl of cereal uh this made me think about the craft mechanics books and made me equally equally giddy to, to know how these people write these things um and how they structure the plot and and what these images what the images tell us about just a look on a face and expression just will give you an entire like history of a person and just how much of a garbage human they are. And it's interesting um, that the artist matches the expressions to what's being said too. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in a non Liefeldian <laughs> manner. Um, so I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed with this, this book um, rightfully so uh, is, is, is considered one of the most acclaimed crime comics of the 21st century. If you don't believe me, it says it on the back of the trade paperback. Um, it, it won six Eisners and Harvey Awards, including Best Writer and Best New Series. Uh, it's got a blurb from Brian K. Vaughn. It's got a blurb from Joe Hill. It's got a blurb from Warren Ellis. That's that's. I that's think I've asked this question before, but just to reiterate, each trade is a different story, correct? It's a different criminal. It's a different, or is that wrong? Kind of, but yes and no. So there is this, each trade take, kind of takes a look at, I think, a different person from the ones I've read. Some of them, not each trade of criminal, but like each of their stories. But so like in this, you get Teague Larson, who is a character in some of Brubaker's other books, um, who I think we read one of them where it's uh, in the 70s. It's kind of an old man. So it's all in the same world. But I think that some of the stories are dejected, like they're they're kind of. An arc is a story about one character and you get to the other. But I've also not read Criminal all the way through, so I may just be thinking of different titles. But I know his different titles play together. Like um, Fatal plays together with Criminal. Um, his The books that he's doing, like his kind of graphic novels that he's doing, like Pulp, um, that is a like there, there are characters in Pulp that are young, that are old men in some of these later books. So it's like it's all a web. So I, I don't know, perhaps, if you could pick up the second trait of Criminals and have it follow the first one, or if you need to read the first trade. But, like, there's an intricate web of, of characters in this world, in this criminal element that he's put together. So, as far as Criminal goes, each trade paperback is an arc. Okay. The Same end. story. <laughs> right, but so, so do I need, so yes, yeah, so we know each one is an arc, but do I need to read, well, I need to have read about Leo to know what's happening in the second trade paperback. Now, they're all self-contained, right, but okay. they're using the same characters and the backgrounds are gotcha. yeah. referred to in each one. Yeah. You can read so each similar one to and not City. be lost. Yeah, right. It's similar yeah. to Sin City that you have different stories mm -hmm. that, Tied mm -hmm. together with the same in the same universe mm -hmm. type thing. Yep, gotcha. Okay, think, that's all. I, that's what I was. Yeah, and I may have, I was gonna say I may have misinterpreted, but what I thought Craig was asking was, you know, can can I go pick up volume three of Criminals? No, I was just curious. Read. It, I was just curious. The reason I didn't get on Criminals mm -hmm. is because it was into it before I got back into purchasing comics, yeah. and I just missed out on mm -hmm. the beginning of it, so I never went back and and did it. Right. You know that that was a you know some books you can jump in into the middle some mm -hmm. you don't want to crime right. stories generally aren't the kind you want to start on issue 12 or something on. yeah 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 <clears throat> that's what you know I, I really like about this universe that they created is there's like it's really hard to find a character with redeeming qualities <laughs> yeah no they're <laughs> you know it's like everybody's a dirt bags to some or more though so than others yeah and you know it's it's a very 
real world story. Mm -hmm. So the it really brings out Brubaker and Phillips' talent for storytelling. Yeah. Because since it's totally real world, there's not big fantastical things right. to happen to get your attention. Or yep. It's all about the characters in the story. These are character-driven stories. Mm -hmm. The stories themselves are, are very, again, ground-level crime stories. They're not huge, complicated heists like Ocean's Eleven or something no. silly like that. These are, you know, hey, we're going to knock over an armored car and it's uh, more shenanigans can. ensue. Yeah, it's it's more akin to like Easy Rollins or the, like the Maltese Falcon, where there's yep. a very mm -hmm. but but it's the it's the people and like what you just said about it, hard to find a redeeming character. It's the same thing I love about the Sopranos. Like all of those people are mm -hmm. scumbags, but mm -hmm. you fall in love with them and you find yourself rooting for I mean, them. Generally, when you watch a yeah. crime story or read a crime story that the protagonist is a criminal, yeah. it tends to be that way. Like there's, you know, you, Breaking Bad, even the the brother-in-law cop mm -hmm. was dirty to a yeah. level, you know, I mean, there, everybody, you know, in those stories generally, it's got grit. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's got grit. So in the, and one of the reasons that I, I wanted to make a point and didn't just pass and like skip over on who the colorist is. So this is the first, first book that I've read that had the colors done by Val Staples. I've read some of their other Brubaker Phillips stories that were done by Brett Weiser. I've read all of them, you know, obviously some of the ones that are colored now by um, Sean Phillips, son. Um, I forget his first name. Um, Jacob. Jacob Phillips. Yeah. Those books, they use, a, <clears throat> they use a brighter palette. There, there's a lot more, um, I don't know what is, is neon a fair way to character. Like they use a lot of pinks, a lot of like bright yellows. I mean, I'm um, reading, I'm reading, uh, Jacob Phillips book. In fact, I just read the last issue, mm -hmm. latest issue yesterday. It's definitely not bright. Okay. You know, yada, yada, yada. Well, in the, in the Brubaker Phillips book, <laughs> I've read <laughs> whatever that, whatever the, the rest of that was in the Brubaker <laughs> Phillips book. He, at least the ones I've seen Jacob do, he really does follow Betty Brett Weiser's color palette. And you, you do, you get a lot of, you get a lot of bright pops of color. You don't get that in this book. You don't get that from, um, from Val. Uh, she, her color palette's very muted. It's, it's, it's very standard crime colors. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's very drab in tone. Uh, the, wonderfully done. I, like, I'm not saying drab is like, oh, this is bad coloring. It's wonderful coloring, fantastic coloring, but it's very neutral, very earth tony. Um, you you don't see a lot of pops. Uh, well, I think that one thing they like is is muted palettes, limited palettes. I mean, that seems to be a trend in all of their books. Is kind of. I wouldn't say that about Brett Weiser stuff. Like I, I would. It's I usually only five or six colors in every book. Yeah, but they're like these backgrounds and stuff. They use a lot of like bright pinks, just like electric colors in Brett Weiser stuff. Um, this is way more earth. I'm earth not going to argue with you, <laughs> but you're wrong. That's that's fine. <laughs> so, but yeah, no. Um, go go read Criminal if you haven't yet. Uh, it's it's there's a reason those dudes are kind of legends in their so own time. So you mentioned Fatal. Does that spin out of that, or is it a different thing altogether? I, it's been way too long. So okay. honestly, I do not recall. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fatal is the one that takes place back in the nineteen. 40s Hollywood? Yeah, it's like a crime noir. If oh, I wait, right. is that the one that takes place in Hollywood? I, I may be wrong. It's like I said. It's if been... it is, I've read that one. Yeah. So, where there's a murder on the set. and Yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't know that that one's as connected. I okay. haven't I haven't yeah. read all I've of read that. I've read that one. And, yeah, so. But... Yeah, no, it's 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 great. Like their their mind for crime crime dramas is no, it's is excellent. Yeah, the that kind of one they did was really good. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever since you know best crime you know series world whatever you want to call it since Sin City, yeah. and and they're you know they kind of brought new life into crime comics. Yeah. You know Sin City created that. You know well since the forties, but um, yeah, this kind of revitalized. Yeah, it, yeah, kind of breathed new life into the crime genre. Yep. You started seeing more of it when this became a hit yeah i mean and for good reason it's yeah fucking stunning i mean it's great stuff like i just poured through this and it's it's a meaty <clears throat> book like it's not a like it, there's a lot to read but it's also incredibly fast-paced so it's it's you know they take time to tell you what you need to know like he's not like skimping on words but it it reads fast um and, and you kind of got to keep up with it I, I, my, my favorite character in this is the old man 
Um, <laughs> he just, just he cracks me up. Uh, he is just thinks he's still 30 and is just still chasing that dream. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, me too. <laughs> Think you're 30 and chasing that dream. Yeah. <coughs> well guys, do we need to, anything else we need to chat about? Talk about anything. Mm. I, I do. I don't have another issue of young blood. So I guess that's, we're done. That's disappointing. I th- you can find one before next week. I bet. I do want to say, I thought it was kind of timely that we were reading the doctor, uh, the doctor strange book this week. Um, I don't know if you guys saw or not, but the Ditko estate mm-hmm. um, filed yeah. a lawsuit to um, to retain rights to Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. Um, if they were to go through the courts uh, all the way through, I don't think they have a winning case. Um, no. But I think that they are pushing. Uh, I, what I expect to happen is that there will be some sort of settlement. Um, they will they will get something akin to the you know Bill Finger making sure that he's always on the byline. Um, that they the family will get some type of trust in the state. Um, so oh, I, I'd be shocked if that happens. I think they'll get a little bit. I of money. think the Disney machine is going to yeah. shut that down, not pay him a dime because if they do, they're going to set a precedent. Yeah, yeah. The thing is that it's a limited time precedent, though, because now the way that those a precedent contracts, all the same, and don't, Mark, Disney is going to no, not pay anybody a dime if they they're not going to. They'd have done they'd have I mean, done it by now. I'll be curious to see how it how it pans out. Um, but where I say it's going to be a limited precedent is because these types of open contracts and where it was not understood that this was a quote unquote work for hire, which is the argument that they didn't know that this was a quote unquote work for hire. Um, now whether or not pans out or not, but that's the argument that they're making. That only is going to get them up to a certain date, um, in the early seventies. And after that, the contracts were hard lined that these were absolutely work for hires. Your creations are not your own. They never will be. They solidified it. Um, to whereas there is at least an argument that then when this, these characters were first graded and first worked on, that maybe it was vague and void. So that's where I'm saying that they can see this as a limited precedent and only go up to a certain date. Plus, it is you know in in the world where Bill Finger has been, you know, we know what happened to him. It's kind of bad publicity. Now, whether or not Disney gives a shit about bad publicity, I don't know. I don't think so. I'm kind of like they you, don't. but I think just to keep this from going further down the road and tying up a lot of money and like lawyer fees and costs and stuff like that, they'll throw them a bone. I oh, I don't. Think I, I, I so. don't see that happening at all. I'll, I'll be. We'll, we'll, we'll They've see got a huge out. pile of bones just for this stuff. Yeah, well, that's, as far that's as throwing true. them a bone. Yeah, that that's true. But uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, I, I'll be curious to hear. I, not, but that being said, I would love if that yeah. did. No, if, for certain. You know, yeah. I just you know seeing this happen over and over again. It went on for years and years and years with Kirby. Yeah. I mean, these things come up all the time. Uh, you know, so. We'll we'll see. Um, the the finger settlement really, I think, is going to play in big into this. So seeing how they did that, which again, different company, but you know, it, it, at the end of the day, what's it actually costing them? Um, you know, more than they want to pay. Maybe, but I mean, uh, maybe. Like I, like I said, who is this? Who is this? Like, it depends on what the money is going for and what the settlement is going to be used for. Because the family, you know, the the families come out and said, "Look, we're not like like we just want really recognition. Like, we want." We, you know, because he's not around anymore, so we we want his legacy solidified. Um, there was a, a write up with his brother who filed the case, and he's like, "We want his legacy solidified." I think the brother would take a settlement if it says, "Hey, sure. like we give you a we give you a byline all the time, and we set up a trust to sure. go to the arts or something yeah, like that." I'm sure. I, I don't see the brother. Um, and I was talking to our friend Zach Cruse, who you know wrote the book about Ditko, who had a conversation with Ditko's brother um, last week. And it seemed to be like the the gist I got was that yeah they're not looking to line their their own pockets for this, so I, I think if they if the settlement comes out or if a settlement is offered it'll look something like a a trust or a, a charitable trust or something like that that'll go. But I mean again we'll have to see because that's yeah. all speculation at this point. But um, it'll it'll be. It'll be interesting, but I mean, at the end of the day, these people who are screaming about, oh, this is going to mean if it happens, Spider will never see Spider Man again. And shut up. <laughs> it's like, that's not what's going to happen. That's not how this works. So, uh, but what does work is that on Wednesdays, uh, new comic books come out, sometimes on Tuesdays, if you read the, the Distinguished Competition. Um, and so each new week, we try to give you a hint about what we're going to pick up. Uh, and because, you know, could be good, could be bad, but we all are going to flock to our local. Uh, comic book watering hole if you will and and grab new stuff so what are you gentlemen grabbing this next week so i'm looking forward to a new uh series from dc comics this is deathstroke incorporated by joshua williamson nice and howard porter Mm. the great howard porter 
So the creative team is pretty damn compelling. I really like the Deathstroke character. I've not seen, you know, Deathstroke in a series lately in the past several years. I really dug on. So I'm interested in this. Um, you know, it says after suffering too many losses, Slade Wilson decides it's time for a change. When he he's enlisted to work with the age-old secret organization called Trust, who want to take down the heavy hitter villains. So he's also going to be teaming up with apparently some other characters, and you know he's going to have partnerships. The first one it mentions is Black Canary. So, and it's being that it's Josh Williamson. That's this is compelling me to check this out mm -hmm. because he's such a dependable writer for me anyway. And Howard Porter's amazing. Yeah, I haven't seen anything Howard Porter's done in a while, it's been frankly. A while. So I'm really looking forward to checking this out. I am going to pick up a book, or I'm going to try to, if we have it here at the shop, a Jewish Brigade, Brigade an uh, original graphic novel by Marvano. Um, after the, uh, in the waning years of World War II, a Jewish fighting force known as the Jewish Infantry Brigade was born apart, uh, as part of the British Eighth Army, mm -hmm. where they help hunt down nazis at the end of the war and that is from uh, dead reckoning publishing so i'm going to continue to dip my feet in the vault waters um, vault comics has a new series coming out this next week called human remains uh looks looks interesting and it's got a really incredible um creative team this is going to be written uh by peter milligan um with a new artist that uh, that i've seen in some in some indie stuff i haven't read all of her work but it's sally um, cantorino she's done i walk with monsters and the final girls so this centers around um around a couple dax and bissa they're they're deeply in love like this is the the relationship that would have lasted forever dot 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 but um in this new and terrifying world love is dangerous feeling anything is dangerous earth has a new and terrible invader invader it's this monster that deprives uh humanity of the very feelings that make them human so, in a shocking tale of pent-up emotions, imperiously loud sex, and forced composure <laughs> in the face of unspeakable horror uh, from that creative team, you're going to see this. So, it sounds a lot like, it's, it's, it sounds to me a lot like the idea of uh, the, the quiet place, except where you, instead of where you can't make noise, you can't make emotions, hmm. where you just have to be kind of stoic all the time, or the monsters eat you. So, hmm. um, What was that movie uh, where they had to take the pills to keep them? Ernest Ghost Camp. Yes, that was it. That was definitely it. It's <laughs> a piece of legendary cinematic history. So, no, I'm going to check this out. It looks fun. Um, like I said, I, I love things that come out from Vault. Uh, they, they are killing it right now. Um, and it's getting to be where I want to read horror comics because it's that kind of year. The leaves are changing. It's getting a little crisper outside. People are putting pumpkins on the front porch. Um, favorite time of the year. So, well, all right, guys, we done? Yep, let's get out of here. All right. Well, hey, you uh, crazy kids at home. Uh, we hope you have a fantastic week. We'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Uh, you know where to find us. Tell your friends. We would appreciate it. If you download us via Apple Podcasts, uh, leave a rating and review if you don't mind. We would appreciate it. Uh, not only does it let us know how we're doing, it lets the machine and the algorithms that run our world um, kind of promote us a little bit. It kind of, you know, rigs the system. Uh, and we would we would greatly appreciate that. Um, in the meantime, you can come find us at all those places that I just told you about. Uh, you can come see us where, where Craig lives on the Facebooks. Um, he will be there waiting on you. I will be hanging out over in uh, Instagram world at SFG Podcast. And Matt kicks it on his like four different troll accounts over on the Twitter. Uh, I do not have troll accounts. The <laughs> uh, last thing you'll ever catch me account. doing is troll anybody. <laughs> it's easy, it's easy. Trolling takes uh, effort. And uh, leaving comments of which I do neither, <laughs> neither. online. He he will be alert. <clears throat> I am a <laughs> I'm a uh, uh, neutral observer. <laughs> he is the watcher of Twitter. Um, you can find all of us there. We're 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 waiting on you. Or you can send us an email. We're at SFG Pod, not SFG. Blah blah blah. Words. Southern Fried Geekery Podcast at Gmail dot com. Um, in the meantime, go forth, uh, wash your hands, and have a great comment. Great fucking week. Why can't I say uh, words today? Wordsy words. 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 And you change the ending of our show. What did I do now? You did not say go forth and love comics. I thought I did. Did not? Well, go forth and love comics. Oh, what a time. Woo? Uh, are we bringing the woo back? <laughs> I don't know where to go from here. You don't well, want we anymore. Just freaked up the whole ending of our show. <laughs> Fantastic freaked radio. Up. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> How did we get PG at the end? <laughs> it's, uh, it's art. I mean, it I'm, I'm still waiting on the Snarky Matt comment, though. So that, Yeah, I, I delivered. Word, words, words. Man, you are all thumbs at the end of this episode. Three left day. feet. Yeah, your tongue's all twisted. I'm going home and going back to bed. Good night. This is bullshit. Bullshit.